this morning. Okay, it's time. Hello, hello. No? How about now? Good. Okay, so now let's start our session. So this is the first session of this IETF. And uh, this is the joint, uh, joint meeting uh, and the dispatch, uh, dispatch working group and art area. So welcome. I'm one of the co-chair, I'm Xu Ping, and uh, it's very nice to be able to finally sit here after a few years. So it means to me that everything is going to be better, right? Yeah, so today also join me with uh, my lovely co-chair, Kirsty. Would you like to see? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Looking forward to a good dispatch session this morning. And also Jim Fanta. <laughs> Okay, so his role will be announced uh, shortly. And uh, uh, one thing to remind that this room, we, we got this uh, auto transcription. So please, uh, for all the speakers, please say your name clearly so they can record you. Now the first uh, is about note well. And due to the time reason, I won't read through it word by word, but please do read it carefully. And all the policies here are being enforced and please follow it. And also for all the speakers, please uh, behave friendly and politely. Thank you. And since we are the first session, and uh, normally we will go through this uh, meeting tips, so just to give you some uh, guidance. And basically, it is uh, uh, roughly the same as last meeting in London. And since this time is due, it's a hybrid meeting. And for the in-person uh, uh, participants, please do use this on-site tool to first join the virtual queue and then the physical queue. So we, in that case, we would be able to have this unified queue. And here is the on-site tool, you will see it. And also, unless you are speaking, please keep your audio and the video off. For the mask uh, uh, policy rule, and we still follow the same rule as uh, last meeting in London. Please wear your mask unless you are actively speaking. So here are some uh, resources and the links for your reference. Okay, now we can start our hybrid meeting for the dispatch part. No, sorry. Uh, first is the agenda. And uh, you could see that we have a quite full uh, agenda this time, and we don't even have the flexible time at the end. So here, um, please, for all the presenters, keep in mind that the time I allocated to you includes the presentation as well as the discussion and also most importantly is the dispatch outcome. So please finish everything and keep your mind on the time. And we got uh, six items in the dispatch and five for the technical. And in the art area, we got one for the uh, both introduction. And about the mailing list, yes, please do utilize the mailing list and uh, to advocate your uh, uh, innovations, your work, and try to trigger the, some discussions and get feedback before the meeting. So that will be very helpful for our dispatching. 
Thank you. Okay, now, so it's about dispatch topics. Yes, and the first one, Murray. Yes, yeah, so before we start, um, just an announcement from Murray. You might notice there are three of us sitting up here, Murray. How about now? Good. Good morning. Um, as the area director for dispatch actually is not here, it's Francesca doing remote. I have the privilege of talking to you in person. Um, one of my jobs is to, one of our jobs is to make sure that the uh, that chairs are given due attention and respect when it's time uh, to make a change. Um, Chris, Kirsty is rotating out um, to uh, her, her time availability is not no longer here. And uh, we do like to uh, keep the keep the blood fresh on the on the chairs. So that sounds awful. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Um, we like to keep fresh flesh. Never mind. We like to keep <laughs> give people opportunities, not burn them out. And so um, Christy will be stepping away after one sixteen. And so first, thank you, Christy, for all your service for the time you've been on. And uh, Jim Fenton will be rotating in. Jim has worked in the email space for quite a while. He currently chairs JMAP and UUID Rev, I believe. Um, I, I've known him since the early DKIM days, and uh, I think he'll, he'll be great here. So welcome, Jim. We can edit all that other stuff out, right? So uh, that's it. So onward. Thank you. OK, for our first. Um, Manu, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Please stop. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, this uh, item is about the multi-formats um, uh, specifications. Um, there are a few of them. Uh, I'm going to go over two of them uh, today, explaining kind of what they are, why they're useful. Um, and um, why uh, we would like some help from IETF to find a home uh, for these specifications. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so what is a multi-format? Um, effectively, uh, it's just a data value, right? It's a self-describing data value. So by looking at the data value, you kind of know what the data value is, ab uh, is about. Um, a multi-format, uh, always starts with a byte header of some kind. Uh, so it's got a header on it. So it's a string of bytes. It's got a header on it, and that header tells you what the rest of the bytes uh, mean. Um, the, the header um, uh, effectively uh, shares all of these kind of names. Uh, the multi-format names share one global namespace. Um, so uh, if something's a multi-format, um, you can uh, differentiate it from uh, all the other types of multi-format. So to give you an example of like what a multi-format looks like, there's a hello world example here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the bits in blue um, are the words hello world uh, encoded in base64 URL notepad. Um, so the U in the beginning, that little green U on the left-hand side, says the next several bytes are going to be base64 URL notepad, and then the blue uh, things are uh, hello world encoded uh, as that value. That's fundamentally what multi-formats uh, do. Next slide, please. Um, so this kind of breaks down what I just said. Um, uh, the header, uh, you know, usually identifies, well, the header always identifies what the rest of the bytes mean. It usually points to an RFC of some kind to tell people uh, where to look uh, on how to decode the rest of the, the value there. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so why are these useful? Um, effectively, you know, we've got data. Uh, data are kind of encapsulated in these boxes of information, and it's nice to have a label on the box to tell you what the data is. Um, so fundamentally, multi-formats are a label on a box that tells you what's inside the box. Um, the 
multi-formats are useful um, in text and binary formats. So um, we already have things like CBOR and tags and things of that nature, um, but multi-formats allow you to kind of have the benefit of those tags, whether or not you're encoding to binary uh, or text-based formats. Uh, today, multi-formats are used to identify all types of base encodings, like base 16, base 32, base 64. They basically say the following bytes are base 16 encoded, base 32, base 64 encoded. Um, multi-formats uh, called multi-hash are used to identify uh, hash strings. So this is a SHA-2-256 value. This is a SHA-3-256 SHA bit length value. This is a shake 256 value. This is a Blake 2B 256 value. They're headers for different types of uh, multi-hashes. Um, multi-formats are also used to identify uh, types of public keys like ED25519, X25519, uh, SECP256R1, so on and so forth, uh, as well as codecs. So um, multi-formats are used as byte headers to tell you that the next set of bytes is a CBOR object, or a raw git object, or a protobuf object. So multi-formats are used as headers to identify all these different types of um, uh, uh, strings, byte strings. OK, next slide, please. Um, so who uses these things? Um, uh, I'm the editor of a number of specifications at the World Wide Web Consortium, verifiable credentials, decentralized identifiers, data integrity. We use multi-formats in all of those specifications. There are a variety of large vendors that use multi-formats as well, uh, Cloudflare being one of them. Uh, Microsoft through um, their uh, new Entra uh, ION services. Uh, Brave and Opera, who have IPFS uh, built into the browser, use multi-base uh, in multi-formats, and the IPFS community in general uh, uses it. So it's it's largely deployed uh, today, uh, variations of it. There are 17 implementations in a variety of languages today. These have existed for many years. And the general ask of dispatch uh, is, you know, given all of these things, is there some way that we can get this usage uh, documented? Uh, via an IF, ITF RFC um, and a set of uh, IANA registries. Um, OK, next uh, uh, slide, please. OK, so real quick, uh, this is one of the uh, independent drafts. This is one of, one of the IDs, is uh, a multi-format called multi-base. And effectively, the multi-base format identifies the base encoding for a string. Um, so if you look at the examples at the top, uh, you'll see the first, first example um, start with the letter Z. That means this is base 58 encoding using the Bitcoin alphabet, and then the rest of it is the string. By the way, each one of these examples is the string hello world encoded in a different base uh, format. The second one is a little u. That means base 64 URL, no padding. The next one is a little b, which means base 32, no padding. Uh, the next one is base 16, hex encoding, use uppercase letters, right? So that lets you know very clearly what the base, the following base encoding uh, for the binary uh, string is. Um, and this is useful in text-based formats like JSON and um, uh, YAML. Uh, so that's multi-base in a nutshell. That's the whole. That's the entirety of what multi-base does. Um, next slide, please. OK, multi-hash is the next one. So multi-hash is a multi-format. Um, but unlike multi-base, which is a kind of a text string format, um, multi-hash is a binary header, right? Um, and so let's say that you have a cryptographic hash that's 256 bits in length. Um, it's uh, sometimes useful to put a header on that value to tell you whether or not it is a SHA-2 256-bit hash or a SHA-3 256-bit hash or a Shake 256 um, uh, uh, hash, right? So that little header, the, 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 the 12, 16, and, and 19 hex um, tells you what the rest of the bytes uh, are, what type of hash it is. The other really nice thing about multi-formats is they compose really nicely. Uh, so the very bottom example you see here in multi-base encoded, it starts with a Z. That means this is a base 58 Bitcoin alphabet encoded 
um, uh, value. And then the, the six is effectively a um, uh, encoding of the, the multi-hash value with the hash um, following in the blue characters to the right. So you can compose these things together uh, to put different headers on things to, to represent um, uh, these, these data values uh, with precision, uh, both in text-based and binary-based uh, formats. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the last slide. Uh, the question is, where does this fit uh, at ITF? Um, I'm gonna suggest that the preferred path here is AD sponsored. I don't know if that's the best path, but it feels like it fits. Um, both of these specs that I described are like two to four page specifications. They're really tiny specifications uh, that are effectively documenting mature implementations. Um, most of the content uh, in these specifications would exist in an IANA registry of some kind. Um, if AD sponsored isn't the way to go, maybe CFRG, because a lot of the stuff that I'm uh, talking about is used in security architectures and systems. So there might be some interest there. Um, there is also the question of, you know, a future potential path, which is a multi-formats working group at IETF. Um, I, I suggest that it's too early for that. Um, we have two fairly simple formats that we could document. And depending on how that goes and what the reaction is to those, uh, then maybe in the future, we can start looking at some of the other multi-formats. So that will require more cat herding um, uh, in time. Um, okay, so that is, uh, that, is, that is effectively the introduction to this work. Um, I have not been looking at the chat, so we could probably do... Uh, questions, concerns, whatever at this point. Great. Thank you very much for yeah, presenting your work. So just a reminder, please state your name clearly at the mic before speaking. It will help with the auto transcription and try to join the queue on Meet Echo. Whether you're in the room or virtual, it helps us manage the queue order. I've seen a few messages on the chat. So I think Sean Turner, you're up first. Yeah, hi, this is Sean Turner. I'm channeling Richard Barnes from the Zulip channel. Um, I guess this question is, my, and I guess this is a clarifying question. Is my impression is that these multi-X things are usually pretty domain specific. Wonder whether there's a need for a global registry thing. Manu, did you hear the question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I can. Um, global registry thing. There's a global namespace um, that is viewed as a good thing at this point. You know, it it that's up for debate. But multi formats tend to you know use a global registry today. That's kind of how they they're set up to work. Okay. Um, thank you, Murray. You're in the queue. This is Murray. Uh, AD sponsored maybe your preferred path. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would warn you that if we do decide to go that way, um, I'm, Francesca is about to go on maternity leave for several months. My backlog is going to get very big very quickly, so that's probably the slowest way. We mm -hmm. should look at other alternatives. Like? Okay. Hello, my name is Martin Durst, and I wanted to ask for this uh, hello example. Uh, can you also do that in various other languages and scripts and so on, or does it work only uh, ASCII? It, it's not ASCII only, it's any binary string. So yes, you can do it in other languages. But any binary is not, doesn't say, tell me what text is it, it is. You have to say what character, what char set it is. Otherwise that doesn't apply. Yep, understood. Martin. Martin, does the response affect your view on the dispatch question, where this work should go, if it should go forward? Well, the, the IETF should definitely make sure that the qu questions like these are, get uh, solved uh, well. So I, I don't know which alternative might work best for that, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So next in the queue, Jonathan Rosenberg. Jonathan Rosenberg. Uh, can you clarify, um, I was surprised there's no magic cookie in front of this. Without this, this will overlap with the namespace of all existing uh, strings that show up in all kinds of places that are just UU encoded. Um, this is somewhat related to whether this is a domain-specific encoding or is something meant for global use. So 
we would clarify uh, is there a reason there's no magic cookie in front of it um at present it hasn't needed one um but that doesn't mean that that's not a bad design so it's a good question i don't think it's it, it hasn't come up in the community yet jonathan do you have a view on the dispatch question um, I think it's too small for a working group. So if we had an AD, I would have that could do it. I would have said AD sponsored, but um, yeah. Thank you. Next in the queue, we have John Clenson. Yeah, I I expressed some of my concerns in an email message earlier, but I don't fully understand the state of this. Uh, you're talking about global, the global registries in use already. If there's a global registry in use already, then uh, then it's not clear we need an IANA registry, or maybe we do. Um, I'm worried about the same uh, introducer or magic something telling telling people what this is that's been mentioned. Uh, if it's done and people have implemented and deployed it, uh, maybe we get the, uh, if an IANA registry is needed at all, we get the... Uh, the AD and the ISG to sign off and of the registry and send the documents off the ISD as informational documents de describing a specification developed somewhere else. And I'm also worried about what I think is an intent to pursue this in parallel in IETF and W3C because that's just an invitation for all manner of confusion and a lot of time and, and wasted a lot of time in coordination. So I've got lots and lots of questions here. I think the dispatch question is dispatch answer ought to be that we need more clarification on this and then maybe it goes to the ISE rather than the ITF. Thanks. Uh, Thanks John, I, I answered the number of your questions um, just 45 minutes ago. Um, so I think there's some good questions there um, and, and some straightforward answers. Good. Haven't caught up. It hasn't caught up with me yet. Thank you. Colin Jennings. So Colin Jennings. Um, I think this should, I think this is good work and it should be moved forward. I think we should do it ITF. I think that's a much better choice than W3C or just doing it sort of as a separate, you know, standalone GitHub project. I think that makes it much easier to reference and use it the other places. And I think it'll be easier to do it ITF than W3C. Now, that leads to the question of where in the ITF, and I'm going to have a question for you about this in a second. I definitely don't think this is CFRG. Of course, they make some of the things that end up as strings here, but I, I think that's totally the wrong place to do it. I think it should be done uh, inside of, uh, you know, basically somewhere in the art area. Um, I don't think this is a good thing to do through the ISC, um, again, because of the IANA registry. And this comes to my question, which I think one of the things that may be the hardest part about this is determine the sort of registration procedures for these, particularly for very short numbers ver or short strings versus longer strings on this thing. So what's, can you say a little bit more about the current policies for deciding what things get a new string in this, in, in how it's been used so far today and what things don't? Yeah, it's a fairly uh, loose open process today. It's got three people in a GitHub registry that are, or sorry, a GitHub repository that decide who gets the low numbers and who gets the high numbers. There hasn't been a lot of fighting over it, um, but yeah, I mean, it's run more or less like you would see an I in a registry run by a set of experts, right? Um, right. Except it's a GitHub repo. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, that's much the same. And hopefully the same people would be willing to do it as the experts for IANA as well. Yeah, so I, I do think so. that just sort of hearing that answer makes me think, though, that if I was an AD, I would not want to AD sponsor this. This is going to get into a very complicated mess fairly quickly. Um, and also you have the timing issues of, of the obvious ADs to do it. So I know it sounds nuts that we'd spin up a little mini working group to do something that's only a three-page document, but it might actually be faster than any other way to just get this done simply. Um, I do think we should move forward, but that's, that's so I, I favor through elimination of all other possibilities, doing a small little trivial working group and calling it a day. Thank you, Colin. Um, next in the queue is Ted Hardy. Oh, Ted Hardy. Oh, I didn't. I, I'm currently Ted Hardy, but I'm willing for him to be Ted Hardy if he really likes. <laughs> um, uh, so I actually put myself in queue to say I think this needs a small working group. I don't know that it's entirely trivial, but I definitely think it needs something a little bit more than AD sponsored. Uh, I agree that it's good work and should go forward. I think part of the reason 
uh, I think it needs a, a little working group is it also gives you a, a place to concentrate the people who will then look at multi-hash and some of the other uses of multi-formats to make sure that uh, they're well understood by the rest of the community because I kind of suspect once this is in place, people will go, hey, can I shove this in a data URI? And that kind of means I need a media type for it. So, or there, there's a bunch of other successor work that's going to leap at this uh, if it gets standardized. And I think having a, a small working group to house that successor work quickly uh, would be useful. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Um, I'm going to cut the queue soon as it's growing. So if you want to join, please get in quickly. Next, Eric Riscola. Yes, Eric Riscola. Hi. Um, so maybe I missed this in, um, in in discussion, but what is the change control story behind this? Namely, do you think it's done? And do you think that if we decided that the right letter to indicate that it was like, you know, ASCII text was Z, would that be cool? Uh, that's a great uh, question. We have, uh, the, the, the tension we have right now is that we have 17 implementations and they deployed it and they've kind of decided that Z means something, right? And so if, uh, you know, through a consensus-based process, we decide that Z means something else, we would create a bit of chaos in the, the community. Um, but I mean, that's kind of what the ITF process is about, is to ask those hard questions, have the current implementations done the right thing. Um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, that those sorts of discussions are on the table if we are talking okay. mini working group. Okay, well, I'm Team Z here, so you know. Um, um, I mean, I mean, so I think. I mean, I, think, I, mean, I guess that I think this goes to the question of working group versus AD sponsored, namely that if like you don't really want to change anything and you want to register the code point registry, and then, then maybe like working group is not the right answer. But if you just want, but if you actually want to like reopen the patient, and, like actually make real changes, then like a working group makes more sense. Um, I do want to respond to this like don't like like Francesca's out, so like don't do AD sponsored. Like by definition, like the working group process requires the AD. And so I just don't understand how possibly it could be faster to do like a working group than AD sponsored. That seems like that seems like incomprehensible. Okay, so just to summarize, I think um, there's a bit of discussion about whether it's faster to do things AD sponsored or working group. It still involves the AD in either case. Um, okay, next in the queue, we have Christopher Allen. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I wanted, I'm in support of this. Like Manu, I'm bridging multiple standards worlds. And part of the reason for this is that this type of specification really belongs at the ITF level and W3C just is not really suited for uh, this type of thing. If it does, uh, if it can't be an informational draft of some kind, then um, I would also love to maybe, you know, think about in the working group, I'm running into a parallel problem with CBOR where we need to have a bunch of IANA tags registered for a lot of different hash algorithms, uh, you know, private key and public key formats, signature formats, new quantum formats, et cetera, where we need that for, for CBOR tags and some discussion about that. So if there is a working group, um, you know, maybe it can also tackle you know, registering not just, you know, having this list, but the, you know, the subset of the list that is specific algorithms that need IANA tags uh, for CBOR would be very parallel and a very useful discussion to, to resolve both of those at the same time. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, so coming up, I've locked the queue. So if you have a view, please share it and Jabba will pick it up that way. Um, please do discuss when we're talking about working groups. I haven't heard anyone mention the need for a BOF, so I'm assuming this would be a non-BOF required working group. Um, Harold, you're up next. Hi, Harold Just uh, I was looking at the format and trying to remember uh, ASN1 from 1978. And uh, this format uh, lacks uh, the way to determine the end of the string and a number of other features that uh, will obviously be needed in real application. So it's just a little tiny component of, uh, of a system. Uh, so it's hard to evaluate. Uh, the registration thing registers keys in a very small space. So I don't know if case is significant, so it's either 26 or double that. Uh, so Obviously, free-for-all is not the right name of the game. 
you need negotiation procedures. All the usages cited are WHC related, as far as I can tell. So one possible option is to say, okay, WGC, get your act together and, and start doing registries for real. That might be longer than AD sponsored, though. And so, uh, uh, it, <laughs> I intend to live longer than the WGC. <laughs> Well, considering that uh, W2C is what was has died and be, been reborn only only this uh, New Year's might might make it anyway. Uh, we obviously need registration procedures if this is going anywhere. They they have to be pretty tight because the namespace is so small. And Harold, so, let me let me uh, jump in real quick. It's a it's a variable length integer. I think I I probably miscommunicated that it's it's not just twenty six characters. It's a variable length yep. uh, integer, so it's a very big space. Yep. Yes, you yes you miscommunicated that. Okay. Uh, um, so that helps that one, which means now I think this is a a very poorly thought out idea, but it's deployed. Uh, and it's not going away, so we should just register it. I would prefer informational in, in individual, just because this is not ITF work and it's not uh, not, not presently needed for ITF work. Uh, that might change in the future. Uh, AD sponsored should make it. Uh, if we really want to take it over, we have to sort out all the hard problems with it including things like character set encodings. And so that's going to be a lot of work. Other option works. My preference would be that uh, WGC grows up. Can I please remind everyone to keep the comments polite and friendly? Thank you. OK, so um, in the interest of keeping to time, can the following queue um, people keep their answers short? Uh, Martin Thompson, you're up next. Yeah, Martin Thompson, I think if we're going to be building something that's got this extensibility mechanism uh, inherent in it without any accompanying uh, mechanisms to sort of negotiate the things that, are, that people understand and, and support, then we have a very difficult sort of interoperability question to be asking ourselves. Is this going to improve interoperability when the only real recourse you have is to essentially implement every single code point that's in the registry? Um, and so um, to the extent that this is documenting things that are deployed uh, and in use, I, I think that an, an informational document, perhaps uh, if someone finds Elliot Lear sometime this week, um, that would be my preference as opposed to the ITF doing the work. I don't think there's much that the ITF can do to improve the situation. Uh, and, and so I prefer independent submissions. Okay, so another independent submissions stream preference there. Thank you. Mark Nottingham. Hello, Mark Nottingham. Uh, I don't have strong feelings about this technically. I just wanted to kind of respond to a few things I heard in the discussion. One was that uh, a lot of people seem concerned about spinning up a short-term small working group. We shouldn't be scared of that. We've done it before. We had Just Font, for example. That was fun. Uh, we, sh we should exercise this muscle. We should have this capacity to do things quickly and, and, and without relying on an AD because their jobs are already really hard. Thank you for your service. Um, another comment that went by was that the W3C doesn't have registries. It, it, it does, in fact. They're just weird if you're used to IANA registries. Um, so if, if that's an avenue that is more appropriate, perhaps you should talk to your liaisons and, and, and figure out whether or not they're useful. And if they're not useful, the feedback to the W3C would be great so they can make their registries more useful. Um, and I'm confused by the suggestion to go to the independent submissions editor because they can't create IANA registries. Because... Do you want to get to the mic? Huh? According to who? According to the process, I think. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer to Pete for now until I find out otherwise. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Handily, Pete, you are next in the queue. Please do uh, keep your answers short. We are nearly to time. Thank you. Pete Resnick. I'm short. I'll keep it short. Um, 
uh, we have done things with IANA before that do not have to involve the IETF. We already have a community here. Time Zone Database created as something at IANA that does not involve the IETF community. They have their community. They can go off and do their thing. This sounds like a community that has a way of getting their decisions made. Give them an IANA registry. We can document it with the ISE and be done with it. I don't think the IETF needs to be involved in this. Thank you, Pete. And then last in the queue, we have Justin Fisher. Hi, Justin Richer. So I think that the way to dispatch this really depends on what the intent of the uh, authors really is, what they actually want to get done. If they want to just write down what's already there and get an IANA registry set up, then I think we should figure out a quick process for doing that. And all of the comments about the most expedient approach and whether it's faster to do it one way or another really kind of it, it, it kind of seems like that's what people actually want to do is that there's not really a lot of request for engineering input into this. That said, I think that there are a number of issues with this that if it did come to the IETF as a work item, I do think a working group would make sense. Uh, for example, composability of different items, like what if I wanted SHA-256 in base 64 URL or in hex or in something like that? Like, do I smash these things together? Do I, am I using UTF-16 code points? Like, what, what am I doing? Yes, I know Manu underneath it's, uh, it's all binary strings, but those strings have to eventually mean something. And finally, there's also the fact that uh, this is giving you a box with a built-in label. When it's used in protocols, which is sort of the IETF's bread and butter, you still need to label the box. So this is not the, uh, I believe somebody said this is not a full system solution. Uh, you still have to say within your protocol, this is a multi-format thing. And in a lot of cases, I think that that ends up just deferring the question of what we allow in this to uh to another format and another layer and that leads to complexity okay thank you very much for your input so at the end of this item it sounds like there are two options going forward one is isc with the appropriate iana registrations um and the other is a small working group which very much depends on the authors um how much change control they want to give over and to what extent the work will be documenting what's already happened versus letting the ietf kind of change things in the group so we'll take this offline um, and work out which of those two paths forward and we'll post a summary to the list after this session. Okay, um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next agenda item now, which is with Wolf, if you're able to share your slides and we'll let you take it away. It's Wolf presenting remotely. Uh, you should be able to hear me now. I'm looking for my slides in the list. Uh, forgive me. My, we can. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. There's something with the Meet Echo tool. You may see okay. several versions of your slides. Yeah, um, I think I only submitted one version of my slides, so I'm looking for... Yeah, we found if you just pick uh, any version, they seem to all be the same. Right. Okay, very good. All right, I have done so. There we go. All right. I am Wolf McNally uh, with Blockchain Commons. Uh, my uh, co-presenter here is uh, uh, Christopher Allen, uh, and uh, he already spoke once earlier. Um, so he may speak up as well to answer questions during this. I have probably more slides than are advisable, so I'm going to be rushing through a lot of these, just highlighting the various things uh, that I think you uh, ought to know if you want to go deeper. Uh, Blockchain Commons is a... Uh, uh, nonprofit, and our basic goal is to uh, help people not reinvent the wheel by inventing really good wheels with participation of the community and then deploying them as open source. So, um, all right, so one of the main things that we've been developing is Gordian Envelope, and there's really two, um, two drafts that we've, internet drafts that we've submitted. One is for Gordian Envelope, and one is for uh, a profile for CBOR, we call, we call DCBOR, or Deterministic CBOR and hope you'll understand the motivation more for that as we move forward. This is the um, uh, link to the uh, internet draft for uh, the uh, envelope, uh, the envelope structured data format. Uh, and of course you can catch that UR, QR code as they go by. Some of these have links for that. Uh, they're all in, in our other notes as well. This is the other one for, um, let's see, actually the, the one would have been for, this was, oh, that's interesting. I expected to see, well, one of the for DC or one for envelope. Anyway, those are the two. 
So let me discuss the motivations really briefly. Um, we use the metaphor of envelopes because envelopes both, both hold documents and are documents. They can hold many kinds of things, plain text, encrypted, uh, redacted, signed, small amounts of data, large amounts of data. Uh, and so our motivation was to create a format that would handle all those things. But envelopes can also do many things. You can, you, know, you, you can secure them. You can seal them and sign them. You can reveal, use envelopes that reveal parts of the information and hide others. And so we wanted a very flexible format to be able to do this. Uh, and that could also be very secure. So um, we conceived of a document as basically uh, a subject and some information about that subject. But those doc those pieces, those subject and information about the subject are also documents. So we have a very hierarchical nested structure. Again, this is all based on uh, a deterministic CBOR. One of the main things, and so this basically allows you to nest envelopes or compose envelopes very easily. The uh, notional structure of an envelope is just a subject and a set of assertions about that subject. An assertion is the predicate and an object. So you're probably familiar with uh, semantic triples, but envelopes go far beyond that basic concept, even though they appear to have that kind of structure. Um, so this is a semantic triple, Alice knows Bob. This is uh, what you see down below is uh, uh, what we call envelope notation. It's a way of summarizing this, the actual Seaboard format in a human readable format. Uh, the actual envelope implementation is a enumerated type. You see there on the right, uh, and you see there's actually eight cases that include um, uh, envelopes with sub-envelopes, uh, Seaboard encoded envelopes, which is just a leaf, uh, envelopes that have been wrapped for purposes I'll describe later, uh, and, uh, but also things like uh, additional assertions, encrypted, compressed, and elided. And this is one of the things that envelopes allow is holder-based elision. So if you receive an envelope as a secure document, you can elide parts of it and still preserve the Merkle tree, which basically uh, allows you to elide parts of the envelope without, uh, without invalidating the signatures. Sorry to um, interject so, here. Um, we, do, we do have someone in the yes. queue. If it's just a clarifying question. No, it can wait to the end. Sorry, do continue. Okay. Um, so because this is an enumerated type, we can have standalone assertions. You can see where this is knows Bob. We can also have envelopes that are simply elided, encrypted, and compressed. And I should, should note in passing that because this is a CBOR, because our structure is very um, tight, uh, just to encode, for example, a UTF-8 string like hello world, uh, which of course UTF-8 is the standard for CBOR, uh, requires one byte for that header and then two bytes for the envelope header. So three bytes overhead gives you just an envelope which contains nothing but a UTF uh, string. So. Um, I want to show you briefly a little bit of the power of envelopes. Um, in this case, we have this semantic triple. You can add, um, there are five positions where you can add additional assertions. So envelopes allow uh, complex metadata or assertions with assertions uh, uh, as much as you like. So there's five positions with envelopes you can add additional assertions. In this case, we've added an assertion to the subject, Alice. Um, at least it's the 01P1, uh, we've added that assertion. Uh, the second location you can add them is uh, uh, is uh, on the actual predicate. In this case, nodes. We've added uh, an assertion. Now, you notice on the left-hand side, it says elided. So anywhere you can add something, you can also elide, encrypt, or compress something as well. The third location is the object. So um, subject, predicate, object. In this case, Bob, we've added uh, on the right an assertion. On the left-hand side, we've elided it. The fourth is on the assertion itself. You see the assertion itself has a pair of curly braces around it and we've added an assertion, uh, we, we've added uh, uh, an assertion to the assertion as a whole. On the left-hand side, that's what it looks like if you elide the entire assertion. And here's the envelope as a whole where we've wrapped the envelope, that's what the wrapped case is for. Uh, and then we've basically added another assertion. This could be a signature uh, or any other kind of metadata you'd like to place on the whole envelope or we can elide the envelope entirely leaving only a uh, a SHA-256 uh, digest. So our goals for this were to be structure ready. In other words, we want to be able to represent all kinds of different structures. Envelopes are basically a tree, but you can use them for all kinds of other node labeled, edge labeled kinds of structures. We also wanted it to be uh, 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 security enabled. Uh, we've identified a number of use cases for envelope and you can see those links here. And all of this envelope is built on a DC board because we wanted to make like, basically make uh, envelopes which could be um, which de several different encoders of the same semantic information would all converge upon the same binary representation. So if they, if they signed it or co-signed it uh, or elided it, you could know what to expect at that at that level. So we based it on Seaboard after surveying a bunch of different formats and we settled on Seaboard because of these attributes that it has that are very favorable, including the fact that it has a section in the spec that describes, a, that, that describes a deterministic profile for it. 
However, we discovered as we got into it more that there's certain things about it which weren't, aren't really as deterministic as we would prefer. Um, so we added a, we created an infinite draft for deterministic CBOR, uh, which we have actually discuss, started discussing with the CBOR uh, working group. I'm sorry if my familiar, familiar with, the, uh, with the IHF terminology is not great yet. Uh, but uh, we have had some discussions with them about the implications of this, uh, and we, there has been some open-mindedness as well as some concerns, which I'll highlight. Um, this is the, uh, I wonder why I have these slides in, duplicated in here. Okay. So um, in our format, in our envelopes for specification, we basically say we have to be, uh, it has to be well-deformed, uh, well-formed deterministic CBOR. In fact, I see why I do this, because some of the slides I sent you uh, were duplicated. Uh, but we've actually updated this so that we're actually referring to our own internet draft here now, because we do add a couple, couple things to it. Um, the point of determinism, uh, I'm not going to go every po bullet point here, but, but uh, I've covered a couple of things yet. It's very important to make sure that uh, when you're, especially when you're dealing with uh, verifiable credentials or things like that, that you have uh, uh, deterministic encoding. And this can't be done just through uh, the codec. It has to also be done with the cooperation of the developer of the, prof of the uh, uh, protocol as well as the, as well as the implementers. So this is what uh, the referral to the spec. Um, and this, so they have both uh, core requirements as well as, uh, 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 as, well as um, some suggestions. And these are the suggestions. So again, I'm not gonna read every bullet point. I'll let you review or ask questions about those. So our view is that uh, we should be opinionated about what we want as long as we're implementing best practices. Um, one of the main, uh, so we looked around and, and said, oh, are there any other codecs that are out there that actually implement um, uh, CBOR determinism as a core value. We didn't find any, so we've written two of them, which are open source up on GitHub, uh, one in Swift, the other in Rust. Um, our goals for the CBOR are here. Again, make it hard to write, non-compliant CBOR, make it easy, uh, uh, an error to read non-compliant CBOR, so we're very strict about what we read and what we accept as well-formed. Uh, part of the uh, issue of well-formedness is in the encoding of maps. I'm not going to dwell on this very long. That's pretty much a settled issue in the CBOR. There is one unsettled issue in the CBOR group, which is uh, how, uh, how uh, longer numerical representations are collapsed down to shorter numerical representations. Uh, you know, in, in JSON, you can compose, in non-canonical JSON, you can, you can write zero in a million different ways. Uh, we want only have one way to write zero, and so we've basically spec that in our internet draft. Um, some of the pushback we've gotten has basically said that this should, you know, that it's okay. You can, you, as long as you define whether the field is floating point or integer, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not my view in general in terms of parsimony and other reasons we can get into, but I wanted to flag that. Um, so we also provide our internet draft for DC board also provides an, uh, some advice on what, how we think that developers and, uh, uh, both implementers as well as, uh, developers of, um, uh, of uh, protocols should observe because again, we don't think the, uh, the encoder can do it entirely. So this has to be a cooperative effort among these levels. Um, and then uh, we basically have other kinds of uh, di uh, diagnostic tools built into our DC bore libraries that, are, that basically output uh, DC bore uh, diagnostic notation that's annotated with various tags um, as well as the, the uh, hexadecimal representation. And then we basically have, another, again, uh, thing, um, errors that must be thrown by compliant DC bore uh, decoders. Uh, and, that, uh, and so we give guidance on that. So that's my slides. Um, and I'm, I don't have an actual statement about the dispatch question. Maybe Christopher would like to step in and handle it because he has experience with the IETF. I do not. Um, but uh, that concludes my basic presentation. Uh, yeah, so our questions for dispatch are kind of diverse. So in the, in the overall envelope format, um, although it will likely be used by security groups um, in the future, and it you know, has some really nice uh, capabilities there, you know, it isn't COSE, it has no signatures. In many ways, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a structure. It's a, you know, it's a structured format. It just happens to be very friendly because of the determinism for uh, use by other protocols that you know need the determinism, but also need the structure that allows them to do some uh, greater privacy and things of that nature. Um, you know, there is only one cryptographic function in it, which is a hash algorithm. So the 
I would really prefer not to have to go up the security dispatch direction into a security group in the same way, you know, Seaboard doesn't have to go to a security group to do things uh, because, you know, uh, uh, because Cose uses it or something. So there's a, a question there. Um, we really do feel like this is a very elegant addition to Seaboard. Um, it's not clear that they want to take it up as uh, as an addition to the to the Seaboard group. Um, it you know doesn't conflict with Cose, uh, but it's it's a, again it's a structured format that allows for a lot of elision capabilities. Um, the second issue is with D Seaboard. Uh, it has been you know it is an, a very uh, uh, you know, a profile for 422 of the CBOR standard, the deterministic section. Um, but it's been argued in the, in the uh, CBOR community that it is merely a profile. It can't be a standard because there are other ways you can interpret 422 um, of the CBOR standard that might be slightly different than ours. So we don't know how okay. to publish a profile. Um, okay, so those thank are you. Like yeah, That's thank it. you, Christopher. I think um, just in the interest of giving enough time for community discussion, if we just pause there, I've seen a lot of discussion on Zulip that it seems pretty clear that D Seabor stuff should be dispatched to Seabor. If you disagree with that or if you agree with that, please mention that. But then a whole separate question on how to dispatch the kind of envelope type work. So with that, I'll just introduce the queue. Rohan, you're first. Hi, uh, Rohan May. So I was trying to figure out um, where the dividing line is in the in the draft and in the presentation between stuff that is entirely in the envelope and stuff that is in DSUBOR, and I couldn't find a clean line, and so I was trying to figure out uh, if you can. It, format is built could you speak to that? Say yeah. again. Um, so the and 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 I just wanted to say like. It seems like you could define an envelope envelope semantics with no concrete syntax, and then also have a concrete syntax that you express, for example, using DC bore or something else. But uh, if that is helpful in sort of drawing your division so that we can understand it better, that would, might be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rohan. So Wes, you're next in the queue. Uh, thank you, Wes Herdiker, ISI. Um, with all of my hats speaking only with the secure asset transfer protocol chair hat. Um, what, I, some of my confusion started with not knowing quite where you expect this to be used. It sounds like a very useful description. Um, I like the idea of an envelope. I, I think it could be used in something like, you know, the SAT P working group eventually too. Can you speak at all though? You started off talking about blockchains and that led me down to the belief that you have specific targeted use cases, but I think you're describing a fairly generic type of thing that could be used in many places. Can you give examples of IETF working groups that might want to use this in the long run? What protocols might this be used for? Well, I'll, I'll start with a few. There is some discussions about how we, what is the future of X.509? Um, you know, how do we in various uh, future protocols allow for privacy uh, through uh, elision and non-correlation? Uh, so, you know, how do I, as a party making a representation, whether or not that's a verifiable credential or some type of supply chain certification or other kinds of statements, be able to sign those statements, but then basically say, hey, wait, I'm not going to give you all of the details of it because you're not entitled to the entire thing. There are also advantages in herd privacy. Um, we have a very specific use case that reimagines the Mastodon protocol uh, to give Mastodon greater, uh, greater privacy because you'd be able to um, uh, allied information that a server doesn't need, and yet it can still be signed by the issuer. So okay. um, we do not do signatures. Um, this is just an envelope format you, that supports, that is very friendly to cryptographic functions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think maybe just a little guidance might be needed to know where else in the ITF it is applicable. It sounds like maybe we don't have a firm answer. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be cutting the queue soon. So please put your thoughts in Zulu or join the queue very quickly and speak very quickly. Um, up next, it's David Skenazi. Hi, David Skenazi. Uh, generally not a blockchain enthusiast. Um, 
I so I, I'm sorry for phrasing this this way. So please don't take offense. But in general, this is not a great way to do a dispatch presentation. Um, you covered what your protocol or your system does and what um, how it's encoded and what design choices you've done. And these are all fine and well and shows that you've done the work here, which is great. But those really doesn't this fact does not help answer the dispatch questions because having skimmed the draft, having listened to the presentation, I still have no idea why I might want this for something. And that could be that like I don't operate a blockchain, but in general, this sounds like a very generic solution and the ITF is not equipped to do those well. So I think chopping it up into smaller pieces that are reusable seems best. So like the um, like Seabor specific part, sending that to Seabor makes sense to me and seeing if the, because that's the logical place and then that's the working group that should decide if they feel like it's a good addition to Seabor or not. The rest feels like it can do everything and I would want a lot more information about like you could use any other of the formats that we have, like dare I say PKCS12 or ugh, other things and why would we want something new? Um, so I would say before we can dispatch that, uh, we need that information. And until we, I get a clear picture, I would recommend dispatching with no action for, for that part. Not even to dispatch the DC board parts to Seabor? Uh, so the DC Seabor part, I would dispatch to Seabor. Okay. And the envelope part, with the current information, I would dispatch no action. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, you're next in the queue. Hi, Alex Chernohovsky, uh, Google. Um, some of what I wanted to say, David just covered. I think that if we look at this presentation and we separate out uh, DC bore from the envelope, it becomes a little bit easier. I think DC bore going to Seabor makes a lot of sense. If you found ambiguity in the draft, that sounds like something that would be worth uh, addressing because you know determinism is great for when you want to do cryptographic operations. Um, the envelope thing, I have pretty substantial concerns about. I've spent quite a lot of time over the last couple of months playing with protobuf and how to do very similar type things with making it deterministic and signable and actually representing data in a way which is useful and i'm very nervous that envelope is too generic it it seems like the sort of thing where it doesn't provide any interoperability to define it as it currently stands because the semantics of what all of these links mean is an application profile dependent thing and i'm really worried if you go and look at what we've done elsewhere with cryptography is when you have ambiguities and extensions, you end up with something which might be, you know, signed, it's deterministic, but you don't know what to do with it unless you have the application knowledge. So I really would like to see folks come back with more specific use cases with what to do with one of these container formats and how, what standardization would benefit. So I would probably go with not now for envelope. Okay, thank you very if much. If I for might input. briefly address that. May I, um, I think it might be Seabor better to has... hear Eric's final point and then you can address yeah. all comments briefly. Oh, all right. okay. Also happy to wait. Uh, Eric Rascuola. Um So it seems like DC bore, like if it belongs anywhere, it belongs in Seabor. So everyone agrees with that. As far as envelope, um, you know, um, like I heard people ask like what ITF system uses this and what I heard and, and like your response is kind of like, well, this might use it, this might use it, this might use it, but we're like not a protocol design. We're not like a, a contract protocol design house. So unless there's some actual consumer that like, you know, that actually wants this, then I think it's really premature to try designing something this complicated in the absence of the requirements. And so like if there are ITF working groups that want something like this and are willing to stand up and say that, then like we should consider maybe spinning up working for it. We have to have a boss, obviously. If there's no ITF working groups that are interested in that, like actually interested as opposed to might hypothetically be made to be interested, then like probably this goes nowhere. So I would say your job, if you want to move this forward, is to persuade some people who be consumers of this to speak up. Okay, thank so, you. So if you want to take a moment just to respond and try to keep the comments quick because of the agenda time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess my Go question, ahead, so I recognize some of the, the challenges and, and such in the sense that this uh, effort was not driven from an, uh, an existing IETF uh, group as a, as a requirement. Um, this is not blockchain, even though we're blockchain commons, there is nothing blockchain in this other than the fact that we're using, you know, hash trees. Um, and lots of things use hash trees. 
our focus is to allow for greater privacy, which is a requirement that IETF has said in all of their do recent documents that we have to build future protocols that, el that are, allow for more privacy. So we came up with a system that allows for more privacy. So we don't know what the next step is. We, we agree that a BOF is premature. Um, we will have a presence of us and other parties that are not actively in ITF, but are creating multi-party, multi-company standards that plan to be at ITF in July. So like, what do we need to do to be prepared in July to be able to have some time and space allocated for us so that you know, we can maybe answer some of these questions? Yeah, so Christopher, we'll work with you offline to do that. Um, I think the dispatch outcome here is pretty clear. The DC CBOR parts go to the CBOR working group to see if they will adopt it. And then the envelope part, I think there's interest in it from the room. There's definitely just a lot of questions about the scope and um, what the use cases are and how it'd be applicable. So we can work with you offline to, to separate that out and flesh it out. With great thanks for your time, um, I just ask if you can stop sharing your screen so that the chairs can reclaim control and we'll move on to our next agenda item. But thank you for bringing your work to dispatch. Um, there's lots of discussion in the room. So up next, we have a protocol for interactive low, intense, uh, low latency media transmission system. And that's with um, Da Peng, if you are on the line. Hello, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you great. Take okay. it away. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Su Ping, uh, can you share the slides for me or I will share my own screen? Um, the slides are being shared for you, if that's okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, uh, okay, thank you. I cannot see my uh, slides, but I will, um, you know, uh, move on and, and you can help to <laughs> synchronize uh, uh, my, my talk and, and the slides. Thank you very much. So I think the first page should be, uh, should be the architecture of this proposal. So, um, you know, um, the online broadcasting service is getting uh, popular and uh, popular and, <clears throat> and there is a kind of new scenario and architecture is that uh, it's not only a one-way uh, video audio broadcasting network, but there is a need for the audience to connect to the broadcaster for uh, interactive uh, communication. Uh, sometimes it's real-time interactive uh, communication. So real-time here means that uh, the service require a very low latency um, and require the uh, audience connected to the broadcaster uh, with a very short latency and then they can communicate, they can have a conversation and then all the video and audio merge together and pushed to all the other audiences. So uh, that is the scenario uh, in this architecture. So um, uh, that, and also from the uh, industry practice, uh, there, there is uh, some, uh, some platform service provider, they provide this kind of uh, uh, communication, audio video communication network. Um, then they open the services to third party uh, uh, services. So that will require some uh, interoperability um, in different perspective. So that is why uh, we bring this uh, proposal here to ITF uh, to try to discuss whether we can standardize uh, some part of this, uh, uh, you know, the signaling and the procedure and other things. So that is the basic background of this proposal. So then we can move to the next slide, which is the uh, signaling procedure. So basically, this is uh, what I just said. Um, there, there is a broadcaster. They broadcast their uh, video audio uh, uh, content to other audience. So the network will push uh, all those contents to other audience. Then there will be a uh, uh, audience, for example, they want to connect to the broadcaster. Uh, they want to have a, a conversation, interactive conversation. So they will ask the network to set up the, uh, you know, the session with with the connection with the broadcaster. Um, so the network then uh, will, uh, you know, get the connection. Uh, 
between the audience and the broadcaster, then the audience uh, audio and video stream will push push to the network and uh, will merge together with the broadcaster's audio and video. Then the merged audio and video will then push the, to the network and the network will push those merged audio and video uh, content to all the other audience. So there will be some signaling to uh, control, you know, the different stages, stages and to, you know, let the network to understand, uh, for example, uh, what content will be pushed and what content will uh, work together and what, what, what signaling uh, to send to the uh, to the audience or to the broadcaster to make all those things happen. So, uh, if we can move to the next slide, uh, the remaining of this uh, draft and the presentation will uh, have a very brief introduction about the uh, signaling uh, propose, proposed specification. Um, so, in in the, in the signaling specification, uh, we have uh, designed. Um, uh, uh, different uh, types of the uh, command, uh, control messages, uh, but all the control messages have a similar, a very similar structure, which which has a message type, and a message length, and a message payload. So we have um, a different uh, uh, types of message. So here we list uh, 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 some e examples here. Uh, 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 which is uh, proposed in the current version of the draft. Uh, the first message is is uh, is a uh, is a merging uh, control message to merge uh, different. Uh, as as I uh, said earlier in the scenario, uh, the audience and the broadcaster uh, video and uh, audio content uh, should be merged together. So the the network will use this uh, message to let. Uh, the edge node to uh, understand how to uh, which audio and video content should be merged together, and the next uh, signaling is is for the audio and video switching. Uh, that will make the other audience to, uh, for example, before the uh, broadcaster and the audience uh, video and con video and audio content merge together, the other audience will can only uh, you know see see the. Uh, content or hear the content from from the uh, broadcaster, but when when the two uh, content merge together, so the network will use the switching uh, uh, message to to let the audience to switch the content from from the broadcaster to the merged. Uh, next one is uh, is a grabbing is is used uh, for some kind of conditions for 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 example for mobility. Uh, uh, for mobility uh, reasons, uh, the network connection uh, quality may be uh, maybe not not so good uh, for those kind of service. Then maybe there is another better link, so the network can you know just uh, uh, switch uh, links. And the the last two one is very basic: the pulling and the pushing uh, message, uh, which is to. Uh, push the content to the network, and uh, the other one is to uh, for the audience to pull the content from uh, from the network. So then the remaining slides uh, is the detailed proposed uh, uh, message format uh, for those kind of uh, control messages. Uh, for example, the first one is a merging uh, secondary message. Uh, uh, it it has a type uh, type field. And we'll have uh, the map, uh, media ID, media URL, uh, which is the first uh, uh, media information. And it will have a second media information because uh, this control message is used for two uh, media, media to merge together. So the second one also have a second uh, media ID and the second media URL. So that is a merging signaling message. Uh, the next one is the switching uh, signaling message. Uh, this one is uh, similar as the previous one, but uh, it has a different uh, uh, message type, and it has um, uh, also has a source media info uh, information structure, uh, and also a destination media information uh, structure. 
uh, which which is both has the media ID and the media URL. Okay, so we can move on to the next one. Is uh is a a grabbing signaling message. Uh, this one uh as uh uh you know introduced previously is used for uh some uh some uh scenarios. For example, in the mobility scenarios. Um, to switch a uh, 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 switch to a better edge node or a better link. So uh, for this message, is is has a, a payload tab and has a a, a new media info uh, info structure, uh, which has a, a media ID and also a media URL, uh, and it also contain uh, error code which uh, indicate uh, the uh, the reasons uh, uh, why uh, this. Uh, happens. Uh, what is the reason behind uh, behind uh, be behind this scenario? For example, uh, is is maybe caused by mobility or or, or other uh, meanings uh, or other reasons. And the next one is the uh, uh, the two very basic um, message, uh, which is the pulling uh, signaling message. Uh, it has a um, um, payload tab and uh, media information. Structure, uh, is is has a, a media URL in in the uh, media information structure. Uh, the the last one, the pushing signaling message, is very similar uh, with the previous one. Uh, it has a payload type, and also a media information structure which contain the media URL. Okay, I think that is uh, the end of my presentation, and in summary. Uh, I think this proposal uh, introduced uh, a kind of new scenario, which is um, which is a broadcasting and interactive video audio uh, uh, network. So in this in this architecture, we 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 found a a, a requirement uh, uh, is that to to uh, standardize uh, the signaling control messages. So this is this 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 message is. Uh, could be a uh, high level. It's not uh, necessarily to bend with uh, the underlying uh, transmission protocol, uh, but from the uh, requirement of the user and the the use cases, uh, it do need some uh, uh, standardization work to make make the industry have a better uh, interoperability. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. So please join the queue if you have comments on this. Uh, on Zulip, the discussion seems to be focusing around if this belongs in um, Mock or in Wishy, but actually outside of Charter for possibly both of them. So please come up and bring your view on the dispatch question. First in the queue is Bernard. Yeah, it uh, sounds a lot like Mock to me, although I, you know, it didn't talk much about whether it would be media or quick, but it sounds like the kind of uh, stuff that Mark has been talking about. I don't think it's related much to uh, what Wish has been doing. Thank you. Ted Hardy, you're in the queue. Uh, Ted Hardy, could you go back to the architecture slide, please? Uh, if I understand this correctly, uh, the gap analysis presumes that despite there being many different transmission protocols, there is a value uh, to having a single um, set of messaging formats which would be used across them uh, for, for this purpose. Uh, I have to say that I think this gap analysis does not match my personal experience and that because the purpose of this is to stand above any of the transmission protocol systems, including mock, I don't think it can be dispatched to mock. Uh, as chair, I do not think it falls within our charter. And I think if this were to go forward, there'd have to be some demonstration that there was real world interest in having uh, this sort of uh, messaging system that was not embedded in one of the other transmission systems. And I think it's an interesting idea as an abstraction. I, I don't think it's actually complete as an abstraction, but it's an interesting idea. But I don't, I don't have any personal experience or evidence that there would be a need to have this abstraction uh, specified, uh, and then uh, presumably other other transmission systems would would pick it up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, so to be clear, dispatched with no action. Yes, thank you. Um, so just I'm going to lock the queue momentarily. So please join if you're interested. 
in discussing this further. Spencer Dawkins, you're up next. So, um, Spencer Dawkins, uh, I agree with uh, what Ted was saying. And uh, the other thing is, um, just like I said, just understanding why why this is not mock uh, would be would be really valuable. Um, I don't know what the best way to figure that out is. Um, perhaps discussing it on the mock mailing list uh, would be would be useful. Um, I'm hoping that we're getting closer to. Um, architectures and definitions and things like that in mock uh, that uh, would help us to understand the, the differences. Uh, but uh, but I, I yeah, agree with Ted very much. Thank you. And then finally, Cullen Jennings, you're in the queue. So Cullen Jennings, I, I actually had, I was in trying to figure out where this should be done. It was, I had a question about the, the scope of the work. So when we have these merge and these messages that control how the media is getting routers and switches, do you imagine those being just given to a programmable, like an SDN style programmable switch that just forwards them on the data plane? Or did you imagine those going up into a sort of, you know, classic style Linux server and, and, and going at, at that level? Like, I'm just trying to figure out which one of those layers you're thinking about, because I think it changes a little bit what we might do with this. Okay, so uh, from our opinion, uh, we think that this this kind of messages should be uh, it, it should it should work with the transmission protocol. It should be understandable with the transmission protocol, uh, and also the uh, the audience system and the, the the endpoint should should be also to uh, understand this uh, this control messages. Uh, it's kind of a uh, application layer message in my mind. Uh, it's not necessarily to bind with the under living transmission and the uh, under layer uh, protocols. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't really know what we should do with this. I don't have a strong recommendation, but I mean, it seems like you could use this to solve the mock problem. I mean, this could be the implementation that was used in mock to solve what much of what mock's doing. So I think there's strong argument. There's an interest in this. We have a whole working group trying to do one of the use cases they're talking about here. And I'm not, I'm not sure that this design is inherently out of scope for mock. I'm not really sure I, I see that. Yes, it addresses a broader scope than that, but it seems like it actually would, would be one possible way of meeting the mock requirements. I, 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 so I, I'm, not, I'm not really suggesting we should, we should s dispatch it there or not. I'm just saying I have a hard time understanding why this is not at all within mock. Okay, thank you. That uh, is the end of, oh, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, yes, a very quick response. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so uh, I, I, I do, I do uh, agree that, you know, this is why uh, we bring this to dispatch because uh, we, we uh, as, as the previous uh, commenter says that uh, it's related to, uh, to Mark and, and uh, but it has a broader scope. So that is why we want to hear uh, the dispatch, uh, the guidance. Uh, uh, where should we uh, move on to this work? But we, 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 we of course, we, we have a, a strong interest to, to continue discussions this work in, in, in MOC. Uh, it's, uh, it's all fine, but is there a better way to, to move forward to gather interest? We can also do that. Thank you. Thank you. So the dispatch outcome pretty clearly to me is no action at this time, but uh, as it is outside the charter of mock, however, I would suggest that you discuss with Ted as one of the mock chairs to see if it is something they might take on with a rechartering. However, his point is that this spans more than just mock. And so you might want to find out where else this is applicable in the ITF and discuss with those parties a little bit further too. Um, thanks very much for bringing your work to Dispatch. Unfortunately, we do have a packed agenda, so we are heading straight on to our next presenter, uh, Jean-Marc. Take it away. Is this on? Okay. So I'm Jean-Marc Vallée. I'm with Amazon, and I'm here to um, present a proposal for improving the Opus codec while, improve, while preserving compatibility. Uh, view control size. Okay, 
So very briefly, um, OPUS is a speech and audio codec that was standardized by IETF in 2012. It is the mandatory to implement audio codec for WebRTC, and it supports a wide range of applications, sampling rates, bit rates, and uh, frame sizes, so it's quite flexible. Next slide, please. So our proposal is to improve Opus using recent advances in audio coding, especially with respect to deep learning techniques. We, the goal is to maintain full compatibility with the original specification. And we have three specific goals in mind here. First goal is to improve robustness to packet loss through redundancy more than is actually the case. Second goal is to improve low bit rate speech, speech coding quality with and without side information. And the third goal is to do the same, but for um, music quality. Next slide, please. So why are we proposing that? So first is that recent advancements in speech and audio coding have really made things possible that we didn't even think were possible back in 2012. Um, but then why in Opus and why not a new codec? Basically, you know, deploying a new codec is very expensive. It is time consuming. Uh, Opus is already deployed to billions of devices. So we are proposing a simple upgrade that can be done gradually rather than pushing a new standard. And also in general, having a single codec for a call uh, reduces interoperability issues. Next slide, please. Now, how we're proposing to do this, um, Opus already has a padding mechanism that allows to put in random bytes uh, that are ignored normally. And so we are proposing to use this padding as an extension mechanism. That means that the main Opus bits do not change their definition. Everything remains compatible. And any older decoder that does not know about these extensions will see the padding, ignore it, and compatibility will be preserved. So um, our proposal for the extension format is in the um, draft uh, on the slide. So uh, you can look that up for more details. Next slide, please. So the first goal that I mentioned is um, redundancy for um, to make Opus more robust to packet loss. And the way we're proposing to do that is to code very low bit rate redundant acoustic features for the past audio within each packet. Um, practically what this means is that each 20 millisecond packet can actually contain one second of previous audio coded at a very low bit rate, which means that you have about 50 times redundancy for about a total cost of about 32 kilobits per second. And then you use these features with a neural vocoder to synthesize the audio that was missed during a packet loss event. Um, so I have some audio samples. I'll be playing them from my phone. Um, the first sample I will play is actually without loss, so you can hear the what the sample looks like. Uh, the second second sample will be uh, with a lot of loss using Opus and the existing redundancy mechanism called LBRR, and the third sample will be what is achieved with deep redundancy. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. To administer medicine is frequently a very difficult matter, sometimes it's to do so. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. So basically with deep redundancy, you can fill any hole in the communication up to, in our example, one second, although that amount is actually flexible. Um, we have a draft here. It's in very early stage, uh, trying to define how this would be um, put in the padding. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we do have subjective results for deep redundancy. Um, they're shown here um, on the left side. So obviously filling with zeros is very bad. Uh, we have a, also a neural PLC that you can try in an experimental branch and you can see there the quality that it achieves. It, it is better than the standard Opus PLC, but still limited. And when using DRED either with or without LBRR, as you can see in the circle, we actually get to a quality that is very close to the clean speech. Um, that was uh, evaluated on the um, deep packet loss concealment challenge data that was provided by Microsoft. Next slide, please. So we do have running code for deep redundancy. It is in the Opus repository in the EXP neural FEC3 branch. The current code takes around five to 10% CPU on a recent laptop. Uh, we are working on reducing that complexity. We believe it's possible to reduce that. Um, for more details, we also have a paper that is out and will be presented at the upcoming ICASP 2023. Um, so that was for the first goal. This, for the other two goals, we don't have running code yet. We do have um, experiments with promising results. Next slide. And so the path we are proposing here is to either reopen the codec working group or create a new ML codec working group. Thank you very much for the presentation. So um, the queue is now open if you'd like to come forward and give your view on the dispatch outcome. Jonathan Rosen. You're Hi, Jonathan Rosenberg. Good to hey. see you again. Yep. Amazing work. Very <laughs> exciting. Uh, thank you for bringing this to the ITF. Uh, so I think from a dispatch, this is a no-brainer working group. Whether you call it codec or call it ML codec is a secondary thing, but this is way too big for AD sponsored or other paths. So it definitely deserves a working group. I think it would be very exciting to work on. I do have a question on scope, Jean-Marc. Yep. Um, here, it looks like you've only used it for redundancy. Can it just be used as a full-on codec, not as a redundant codec? It is something we can discuss. Uh, the the technology and the way we have it now is highly optimized for the case of redundancy. For example, you decode going backwards uh, and it uses a lot of prediction. So it's really optimized for that. Okay. You could uh, use the same technology to make a codec out of this. I'm, we can debate how this is useful or not within Opus specifically. Okay. Great. It's not technologically impossible. We just need to discuss um, whether it's useful or not. Okay, great. And then the second, just as really a small technical comment, um, you talk about this idea of just putting it in the padding bits so that it like is basically backwards compatible. But honestly, you're not going to send this overhead unless you know the receiver can receive it. So you're going to probably signal it anyway. In that case, you could probably do it as a proper negotiated extension. Again, this is just a small technical comment on okay. how you're encoding it. Thank you. Yeah, if Thank you, you do have um, technical comments, please try to leave them for the break. It sounds like people are very interested in the work. Just a clarifying question on Jabba, um, sorry, Zulip. Uh, is this Opus extensions or a new codec? Sorry, this is an Opus extension. It is not a new codec. It will be um, both forward and backwards compatible with the Opus specification. Okay, thank you. Next in the queue, Stefan. Stefan, if you're speaking, we can't hear you in the room. Do just check your mic setup and we'll move oh, through the queue. Oh, hello. Can hear you now. I think I'm... Hello. <laughs> yeah, sorry. This uh, me echo. This me echo. My apologies. Um, so, uh, the my so <laughs> Stefan, you are you are breaking up quite a lot. Although it might be just endorsing the need for this this work. Can you try one more time? And if not, we'll yeah, so, move through the queue and come back to you. <laughs> Normally, I would recommend to go elsewhere. 
But in this case... Okay, sorry, Stefan. We'll, we'll come back to you. There are some problems with your audio. I would suggest just refreshing, refreshing the page and we'll come back to you later. Uh, Mo, you're next in the queue. Mozanati, I think Stefan, you must be using one of those ITU codecs. Is that the problem? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for the dispatch question, I suggest uh, a new working group. Although um, I understand that it's you know tightly coupled to Opus in the current implementation, I think people are asking about does it have broader applicability. Um, so I think reopening codec and focusing exclusively on Opus, um, you know, may limit some of our choices. And a new codec working group uh, focused on this ML approach. I think may have a wider appeal to more people. Um, I do understand you want to keep the Opus compatibility to avoid some signaling, but I also I think we need to work on that technically because I don't see how you know you could have padding collisions with other things that are doing other types of extensions. So I think we're going to have to have some control signaling to identify that there's there is redundancy in this in these in these padding bits. Um, but I think that all of that all those technical issues should be fleshed out in a new ML codec working group. And as uh, as chair of the former codec working group, I'd be happy to to um, offer as uh, a chair for the new ML Codec Working Group. Thank Thanks. you very yeah. much for the volunteering. Um, I'm going to lock the queue shortly in the interest of time, so please join quickly if you want to join. Up next, Magnus Westerlund. Yes, Magnus Westerlund. Um, so do you expect to have more people actually being able to uh, really into this work going forward? I mean, my remember of the Codec Working Group, it was very few people who actually really into this work and understanding it and be able to review and improve it? Or is this uh, just a rubber stamping exercise? Uh, this is absolutely not a rubber stamping exercise. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, the current drafts are very far from final, so there is nothing to rubber stamp right now. Um, <clears throat> we are talking with different people and um, that are interested in contributing. Um, and there are different types of contributions, all of which are welcome. Uh, some is obviously the sort of low level work, but there is also a lot of useful contribution in terms of feedback, testing, implementation, figuring out exactly what are the right things to be ev even aiming to solve. Um, and uh, yeah, so th this is not just a one, uh, a one company effort. Uh, on those other objectives rather than redundancy uh, you ha you have no currently like scope for what what how large improvement you would think would be needed or to say expected for for those aspects of saying if you're going to do it then um as, as su some type of success criteria <laughs> uh, uh, so we do know uh, we already have an idea of what is possible because uh, several years ago, um, Jans Koglund from Google and I ran some experiments by simply taking the Opus output and sending it to a resynthesizer. So basically analyzing the acoustic features and resynthesizing from it. And we know it is already possible to make six kilobits per second wideband Opus, which is terrible, sound like nine kilobits wideband. So we already know that is possible and we believe we can actually achieve more than that. And that is without side information. So with side information, we should be able to, again, achieve more than that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, ben Schwartz, next in the queue. Hi, uh, Benjamin Schwartz, nice to see you, Jean-Marc. Um, I, I wanted to support opening a new work group for this. Uh, I want to support the idea of making the scope broader to not just Opus extension, but also to consider uh, totally, new, totally new codecs in this space. You know, I think that uh, codecs in particular have a dynamic where you you can't rest on your laurels too long. Uh, and if we want to see royalty-free audio codecs continue to be the, the universal standard here, we need to make sure that they keep up with state of the art or, or we'll find royalty-bearing codecs that are starting to chip away uh, at Opus. So uh, I really want to see that happen. Uh, I also think that this is not something where we can just sort of create a working group because there are some really interesting standardization questions that I don't think the IETF has ever dealt with around what it means to standardize a neural network model with a set of weights. 
uh, the Opus standard, for those who, who don't remember, has uh, pages and pages of, of base64 at the bottom, which contains a C code implementation, which is the like official normative spec of the Opus codec. Uh, you know, that was weird enough. Um, jamming neural network model weights into an RFC is, is, would be like an, an order of magnitude more bizarre. And so I think we may need some process work to figure out you know, what it even means to standardize it. Um, okay. Maybe if I can respond here. Well, um, can I? <clears throat> oh, I'd like to add a bit before you respond. Go ahead. I am next in the queue, I think. Yeah, can you stand closer to the mic, yeah. please? Thank you. So, Robert Sparks, I was one of the 80s at the time responsible for the Codec Working Group. And I did want to speak specifically to um, not defining um, your decoder in. Um, a programming language that's jammed at the back of, of an RSC. We learned that this was not the way we want to do work, and I don't believe that that's what's being proposed. Um, the uh, I'm going to stop and let you respond to him after what with that, but then I've got some other things I want to say. So. Okay. Um, so in terms of how we intend to standardize this, <clears throat> definitely not C source code like we did the first time. Um, we also want to avoid a huge neural network. Here's the standard, you can't change it anymore. What we are trying to define is the minimal amount that needs to be standardized to ensure interoperability. Uh, for example, in the case of, of deep redundancy, like we presented, the likely outcome, or at least what we have in mind at this point, is that you would specify a small set of weights for the neural decoder because you just have to, uh, that take bits, produce acoustic features, and then you are free to use any uh, neural vocoder that you like that will actually synthesize the audio. So that part would not be specified, maybe have some constraints. And similarly, the encoder would not be specified. So if you look at the current implementation of deep redundancy, maybe only 10, 20% of the weights would actually need to be in the standard and we would work very hard to minimize that. Okay, thank you. So I think just to remind us, we're sticking to the dispatch question. So if it's about clarification of scope or a recommendation for outcome, that would be very welcomed. Yeah. Please and avoid uh, talking about the technical merits and so on of, of the draft at the moment. Thank you. No, it, did, it does make a difference about whether things specifically to the working group are not questioned. So amplifying what Magnus was asking, the work being proposed, I think, is more germane and approachable to the IETF participant body um, than a lot of the detailed in implementation information inside um, the original codec work. We're not talking about the the kinds of things that we did when you put together the, the, the two parts that made up Kodak. We're now talking about something where we're going to be speaking more about carrying parameters, how you frame things in packets, um, and doing things with backwards compatibility. And I think that there is um, engagement there there is the opportunity for the ietf participants to improve the content of the spec and actually engage in a meaningful conversation and not this not have this just be a conversation between two experts in the room and and a bunch of other spectators so i do think this is something that deserves a new working group um and i'm excited to to help work on it Thank you. Cullen Jennings, you're up next. Please, in the interest of time, try to keep it short. Yep. Cullen Jennings, um, strongly in favor of doing a working group in this space. I think we should form one right you know, quickly. Um, now, to the point about the specifying ML models, I do not think we should try and figure that out before we charter a working group. I think we should charter this working group with one of its goals to be to figure out how to standardize those as a starting point in the ITF. And this will be the first time we've done it, agreed. Um, but clearly, we have to figure out a way to do this to be relevant in the future. A ton of our stuff is going that way. I think there's a bunch of other groups that would, sorry, not ITFers. I think there's a bunch of other uh, 
people doing working on this topic at various companies that aren't here today, but definitely would show up if this work was going on. Uh, Cisco during the sort of you know during WebEx and everybody using WebEx at home during COVID, we saw a lot of problems with that, and we started working on techniques that this problem would solve exactly. So I think the group that was working on that would be very excited to participate in such a working group. Uh, I know this group at Google is doing similar stuff. Some people at Microsoft doing similar stuff. It wouldn't surprise me at all if many of those people also wanted to participate. So I think there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of interest in this, this general space right now. And I think we should just move quickly and do something um, and not get hung up on the problem of we haven't specified an ML um, algorithm before. Of course, we have to figure out how to do that. But uh, the working group should figure that out. Thanks. Thank you. And then finally, Jonathan Lennox, you're in the queue. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Lennox. No, no, it's like, no, I'm going to direct you on this work. I'm not sure my media is working. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. OK, yeah, I'm not sure my camera is working. I'll turn that off. Um, yeah, so um, I agree that should be a working group. I guess the question on what its scope should be, I think it's, I would say its initial charter should be uh, just accepting to Opus. Specifically, Opus, specifically backward compatible extensions. Um, I agree that maybe a revised uh, codec might be a useful thing in the future, but I think if somebody has an idea for that, that should come to dispatch, and maybe that could be a you know recharter of this group, or it could be a different group. But that should we should cross that bridge when we come to it. And for now, what's on the table is extensions to Opus, and I think this new working group should be chartered specifically for that. Great, thank you very much. So from the summary of discussion in the room, it sounds like pretty strong consensus that a working group should be formed and it's over to you then to create a charter, work with ADs and we'll share it to the list moving forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for bringing your work. Um, so up next, we have uh, emergency E911 services over Wi-Fi presented by Shri. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This is a new proposal on emergency E911 calling or Wi-Fi. First slide. Yeah, so this is uh, the FCC CSRIC group, which essentially they make uh, recommendations to the FCC commission for rulemaking. Next slide, please. So the scope of the working group four is about enabling, increasing, uh, making greater availability of 911 service or Wi-Fi access. So that is the, the charter for that group. So they're documenting proposals and mechanisms that present to FCC so that they can uh, you know, do the necessary rulemaking. So for supporting, next slide, please. So the three scenarios, I think just to you know, set the context and characterize the environments. Today, you know, if, you, if there's a public cellular network available, if the device is SIM capable, I can make a 911 call. I think that is uh, even with an expired SIM or uh, no SIM, potentially I'll be able to activate the 3GPP defined emergency procedures and will be able to make the 911 call. Now, the other scenarios, now if the device uh, is not, uh... yeah, go ahead. Um, Roman May, I think it would be useful for you to explain to people in this room who are not from America, what 911 is? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for that comment. So, 911 is the emergency uh, the, uh, phone numbers that are avail available in the United States. They are in every, based on the regulatory domain, they, these numbers change. I believe in Europe, if it's 211, I believe I'm not too fam but uh, 112, sorry. So, yeah. I, I was thinking about it when I put it, should I say emergency 911, but I thought, you know, maybe I yeah, somewhat, yeah, it is. Uh, so this is about emergency dialing. So the scenario that we are looking at is if there's a Wi-Fi, if there's no public cellular network available, meaning I'm in a basement and there's no public network available, or my device is only Wi-Fi only cable device. In this scenario, how do I latch onto the network that is available, right? And I make a 911 call. That is the scenario that we are looking at. That's the scope of that. Uh, now, the middle scenario is what? Now, if the access network is a trusted network, if it's, for example, an open roaming hotspot where the access network has some, uh, the, the roaming consortium issued uh, certificates, it's a trusted node. In such scenarios, you know, how can we make the 911 call happen? I think that is the scenario that we are looking at. Next slide, please. So, scenario description is, you know, again, 
i take my phone i'm you know there's no public network available i need to make an emergency 911 call now i have a special i'm now i'm touching the solution elements now if there's a emergency pass point profile on my handset on my device the pass point profile is mainly for connecting to for intended for connecting to a network for making an emergency 911 call now if the network access network is an open roaming hotspot and if it supports emergency 911 call it will allow me to latch on to that network now i'll be able to as an endpoint will be able to obtain the emergency sip configuration the ims service configuration and file we finally will be able to make the call so there are few elements in here i think the question is what do we need on the endpoint for connecting to the access network and what should the access network do how can it allow temporary transit you know transitory access to an endpoint and what service configuration it should deliver to the endpoint finally how do we make sure that the location that the endpoint is signaling is indeed the actual location right meaning i i cannot be here and say i'm making a call one from tokyo right i think that is the we have to solve the location problem so these are the three elements in here right those are the now what we are proposing is solution based on open roaming open roaming just as a primer i put some slides at the end is an alternative to 3gpp is carrier centric roaming meaning gsma has defined the the interworking between operators i can take my phone verizon phone today i can make you know connect to the local network here and my roaming is working in the alternative what wb has defined is for wifi right i can be in any hotspot i can be host i can be having the credentials of a different identity provider but as long as access network is part of the same consortium roaming consortium i'll be able to make the 911 i'll be able to attach and you know roam to that network what we are extending is next slide please what we want to extend is essentially you know the the same approach next slide i think these are the key technical elements but i think uh, the finally i want to latch focus on the next slide yeah on next slide please yeah this is the overall system architecture i think if you look at it here what this has number of elements an endpoint with an emergency pass point profile again what we are asking the fcc commission is to make a rule making showing that every device that comes out of the manufacturing will have a, a, a pass point profile that includes the emergency access in you know, a mechanism so the credentials that is one thing second aspect is we are also asking you know uh, the the access networks like you know essentially hotspots to be able to support that pass point profile now in what form how they make the rule making is i think that the key question is it is about liability today even if you look at 82.11u they have defined mechanisms for emergency thing but nobody no device supports it no network supports it i think the the issue is the liability if there's a call failure you know who is protected i think that's the now what we are asking is by bringing the open roaming into the equation essentially potentially fcc can step in and say that you know if there's a call failure we are we are going to provide immunity to the access network so we are extending the wbs you know the legal framework between the access network and the and the and the uh, and the identity provider to include rules for e911 calling i think that is the the new legal things but from the solution point of view again there's an emergency pass point profile then the access network the ability to signal those emergency or coi or saying that i'll give you access if you are making a 911 call and the final the other elements are in the system are just having connectivity does not solve my dialing problem the default dialer today on my phone is a cellular it's tighter cellular access meaning if i just have wifi connectivity i cannot make a 911 call unless i have some a calling dialer application so the question is in here what sip ims configuration can we provide to the endpoint so that it can you know terminate its call on a sip proxy somewhere in the in the uh, in the network and will be able to make the 911 call so the elements in the system the pass point profile the free the ability to discover a network which supports emergency calling uh, attachment obtaining the service configuration and finally making the 911 call and the location the location how do we solve the location problem i think in the, if you look at the sip architecture the endpoint in the pni header can signal the its location but how can the network trust that it's a true location here what we are saying is the access network can also signal the location that way 
when there's an emergency 911 call, a SIP call comes in, it can you know, make a, a query to the IDP saying that like, you know, I'm seeing a call here. Is this the right location? That way the 911 system can cross correlate between what the endpoint is saying, what the network is saying. So this is how we can essentially solve the location issue, rogue callers, right? I think that is the, the other element in the system. But I think the, the, in all of this, we are not requiring some new, new protocols or anything new on the endpoint. I think all we are saying is a standardization of a new passpoint profile. Passpoint profiles are supported across the device ecosystem. It's just a standardization of a new profile, which is intended for this and, and FCC to step in and make the rulemaking for all of this to happen. Finally, the, essentially the, the, the network in the, in the, in the, the identity provider, FCC should say that the sos.fcc.authorize.org is, is my realm. I am responsible for this. It's not tied to any carrier. It's carrier independent solution. That way you can make the call for anyone. So the document has, you know, there's a next is a call flow and other details, but, but these are the overall, you know, elements in the system. What I want is some feedback from this working group. We see there's value in this. I think it is about greater access to 911 service. Should, you know, IETF, we should provide more tools to the system. Otherwise, currently, what is the current state is, it's just the carrier centric state. Sorry. How do we disturb that is the, is yeah. the final. Sorry, sorry, to, I'm really I'm sorry to cut across you. I'm um, just in the interest of getting a dispatch outcome, we have come to time. So you asked yeah. for 10 minutes and that's the, I'm done. I'm done. yeah. So we just very quickly take any, clarifying questions from people already in the queue, but I'm afraid, please keep it short. Uh, speaking, I, I think several people in the room had forgotten that ECRIT is actually still open. Um, and it's the group that uh, handles emergency things and has the, the set of people in it that understand how to deal with NANA and PSAPs, et cetera. And they're the ones who are, who are, who are primarily concerned with making sure that the kinds of location that they're dealing with are sufficiently accurate, that they're not being used to SWAT, et cetera. So I would definitely suggest taking the work to ECRIT, uh, making sure you get their, their feedback um, before coming back. They, I think some of the protocol work uh, that you would be looking at here is outside of ECRIT's scope, but in terms of the location and the location privacy stuff, interacting with the PSAP mechanics, it's the right group of people. Okay, okay so thanks, suggestion, thanks. take it to ECRIT, um, or ECRI as I was gonna say. Uh, next, Jonathan Rosenberg. Yeah, Jonathan Rosenberg. Um, where it goes depends on what parts require standardization. I thought I just heard you say it doesn't require any new protocol work. It just requires a new profile on the device for the access point, in which case I hear no IETF action is needed. Uh, Am I confused by this? Just one clarification. On the end point, we don't need uh, new things. Uh, that's one thing. But with respect to signaling location, Currently, there are certain gaps uh, in the currently what is uh, supporting the DHCP is there's a civic location that can be signaled, geospatial coordinates can be signaled. But I think we need some new extensions like a secure location tag, which is more an index to the real location. That way, if an access network signals the SLT along with the real location, it will, it will be, can be cross correlated. But I, I can take it offline. But, but there's some standardization work on the ND protocols for location signaling. There's some work, but largely on the endpoint, there's nothing. Uh, okay. Yeah, it depends on. Yeah, yeah, so some need to clarify which bit yeah. should be standardized. Yeah, that, that's the part that needs clarity is okay. what okay. is it you're wanting What's, to standardize? Okay. It's still not clear to me. Thank uh, you. The overall uh, solution, maybe that's Next not is Bernard in the queue. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 you could, we just have two more in the queue. Bernard, next. Yeah, uh, so to clarify Jonathan's question, I think what he's focusing on here is location, Jonathan. Um, and the geolocation working group is closed because um, a bunch of the things like the radius location thing and also the DHCP, you know, I wrote them and they were uh, created in the geolocation working group. So that may be the item uh, I think he's talking about here. Okay, thank you. And then finally, David Gnasi. Hi, uh, more of a clarifying question. So my understanding is that this would be useful for carriers because they're the ones doing this today. And so in order to switch, you would need uh, the uh, cell phone like device makers to implement this with agreement from the carriers. Have you brought this idea to them and do you have support and buy-in from, from those? We haven't uh, you know, talked to uh, the device makers yet. I think right now the work, we took this work to the FCC CS group. It, the work group was adopted. It was uh, taken as a, one of the solutions, right? Now, I, I, I think few things I need to clarify, right? I think overall, it is a it uses number of 
elements in the overall system architecture right there's a location component there's an there's an idp component right i think what i'm looking at is you know can idf publish some overall solution saying that this is another tool right and in the process also identify some gaps right i think that's what i'm looking at right but at the end and uh, okay, we have okay. to, one final comment is so the end device has to see the the default dialer that's in the handset today is tied to cellular i think we should decouple that i think uh, so the, that's where we i need help we need help from the the end point the device makers saying that like yeah the configuration is not tied right. to cellular access okay yes, so that right. sounds like good for offline discussion thanks very much everyone for your input on the dispatch outcome take some parts to equip and clarify the rest of the scope get their input and then come back for a further dispatching view okay thank you very much sorry rush rush discussion sorry okay yeah thank you all right so being flexible with our timings here we've got the art area portion of the meeting um just now that's the end of the dispatching point we'll put all the outcomes to the list in the interest of time and um, we'll just quickly run through these slides to show you upcoming meetings of interest throughout the week um, there's a few boffs, there's a few things going on. We'll hear more about the structured email boff in just a moment. Uh, sorry for only giving you five minutes on the agenda instead of your promised 10. Um, other dispatch meetings of interest also listed there. If it's your first time in ITF, feel free to come and ask us about different parts of it. And then Murray for the art area. Uh, one quick note, there is a presentation by Dan at Sec Dispatch that is spe email specific. So um, I would love it if we got more than just me in the room at Sec Dispatch to talk about uh, an email topic. Great, thank you. So now we move on to our final uh, agenda point, structured email, the fact there is a boff happening. Thank you. Hello, this is Hans Jörg. Uh, I probably don't need the full five minutes, so you'll get your coffee soon. Um, this is uh, to advertise a structured email boff tomorrow morning, 9.30, um, I think in room G403, you see it here. Um, if you can't make it to the buff, and of course, in addition, also feel happy to um, subscribe to the structured email mailing list. You see the address down there. And um, if you wonder what it is, I have one very small slide on uh, giving some detail <coughs> what might be meant here. So the overall idea is to make email, which is currently mostly something for humans to process. So most of you, I think, at this very moment are processing some email, um, maybe. And um, this is mostly manual work. You need to read something. You need to take actions on it. So uh, for many emails, it might be relevant to have a um, structured annotation to it so that some automated tools or agents could probably help you better understand what's going on and how to proceed with these emails. Um, so I believe this is a relevant extension to email. Um, there is already some related work out there, which is basically um, big providers offering that. Um, so I believe there needs work to be done to get this um, out to the average email user and make it available you know, for the whole email ecosystem. Um, and yeah, work. Work, is, work needs to be done, I think, uh, broadly in terms of makes, making this available um, and making it more applicable and um, um, usable out there. And um, yeah, I'm very happy um, if you join the buff and um, there's more details there. Um, and um, if there's any other questions or discussion, just come to me and come to the buff. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for free. So do go along, that's tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning. Um, we've got a note from Francesca, she'd just like a couple of minutes, it's our remote AD. Uh, Francesca, please take the floor. Hello, does this work? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I cannot hear, but... Uh, okay, good. So I just want to mention that, yes, I will be going on leave again um, from uh, April 1st to August 31st. And I've informed my chairs, they know what to do. Um, and the documents that are currently with me uh, are... Oh, sorry, we can't hear you anymore, Francesca. Um... We'll just give her a moment to change the audio. So, yes, so the documents that are currently with me are getting uh, uh, taken over by other ADs. So I will communicate that with your documents authors. Um, 
and to the chairs of my working groups, please uh, notify Murray if a document is sent to publication request to state, uh, otherwise Murray will not see it. Uh, I also wanted to um, bring up that there is a new directorate that has been created. It's the HTTP directorate. Uh, Mark Nottingham is our uh, secretary. Thank you, Mark. And um, the goal is to make HTTP, uh, yeah, to make HTTP reviews of documents. Uh, chairs can request reviews or ADs can request reviews. So just so you're aware, new director. And that's it for me. Thank you, Francesca. And um, just to say warm wishes for your leave. Hope everything goes well from us in the room here. So with 30 seconds to spare, we will close out this art area and dispatch meeting. As always, thank you for your contributions and your view on where new work should go into the ITF. And thank you to all our presenters. We know it is tough on a Monday morning to present your work to quite a large group like this. So thank you so much for your time and uh, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. The clapping is amusing. Yeah, that was sort of like half-hearted, yeah, never yeah. quite got there. We're still alive! Yeah, your, uh, your, your support for the OPA session.